by the standards of the time, which is the 7th century A. B. The laws of war that are laid down by the Quran are reasonably humane, he says. Then we turn to the Bible, and we find something that is for many people a real surprise. There is a specific kind of warfare laid down in the Bible which we can only call genocide. It is called here, and it means total annihilation. Consider the book of 1 Samuel, when God instructs King Saul to attack the Amalekites and utterly destroy all that they have, and do not spare them, God says through the prophet Samuel. But kill both man and woman, infant and nursing, child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. When Saul failed to do that, God took away his kingdom. In other words, Jenkins says Saul has committed a dreadful sin by failing to complete genocide. And that passage echoes through Christian history. It is often used, for example, in American stories of the confrontation with Indians not just as illegitimate to kill Indians, but you are violating God's law if you do not. Jenkins notes that the history of Christianity is strewn with harem. During the Crusades in the Middle Ages, the Catholic popes declared the Muslims Amalekites. In the great religious wars in the 16th, 17th and 19th centuries, Protestants and Catholics each believed the other side were the Amalekites and should be utterly destroyed. Holy amnesia but Jenkins says, even though the Bible is violent, Christianity and Judaism today are not for the most part. What happens in all religions as they grow and mature and expand, they go through a process of forgetting the original violence, and I call this a process of holy amnesia, Jenkins says. They make the violence symbolic, wiping out the enemy becomes wiping out one's own sins. And many Muslims interpreted jihad, for example, as an internal struggle, not physical warfare. Out of context there may be a popular notion of jihad, says Walid El Ansari, but it is the wrong one. El Ansari, who teaches Islamic studies at the University of South Carolina, says the Quran explicitly condemns religious aggression and the killing of civilians. And it makes the distinction between jihad legal warfare with the proper rules of engagement and urge off, or terrorism. So, what is going on here? After all, we all have images of Muslim radicals flying planes into buildings, shooting up soldiers at Fort Hood, trying to detonate a bomb on an airplane on Christmas Day. How to reconcile a peaceful Quran with these violent acts? El Ansari says that in the past 30 years, there has been a perfect storm that has created a violent strain on Muslims. The first is political frustration at Western intervention in the Muslim world. The second is intellectual. The rise of Wahhabi Islam, a more fundamentalist interpretation of Islam subscribed to by Osama bin Laden. El Ansari says fundamentalists have distorted Islam for political purposes. What they do is they take verses out of context and then use that to justify these egregious actions, he says. El Ansari says we are seeing more religious violence from Muslims now because the Islamic world is far more religious than is the West. Still, Jenkins says Judeo-Christian cultures should not be smug. The Bible has plenty of violence. The scriptures are still there dormant but not dead, he says, and they can be resurrected at any time. Witness the white supremacists who cite the murderous Phineas when calling for racial purity, or an anti-abortion activist when shooting a doctor who performs abortions. In the end, Islam instructs Muslims to defend and not attack, prepare for war as a preemptive measure to protect the peace, not to wage war against those non-Muslim peaceful individuals or nations. Here's a great verse from the Noble Quran to conclude this article and to highlight the peaceful message of Islam. Allah does not forbid you from dealing kindly and fairly with those who have neither fought nor driven you out of your homes. Surely Allah loves those who are fair, 